Oh, all right, so we've had some uh, technical adjustments to make here. So I'm Dan Sparling. I'm uh, just introducing our speaker today. It's uh, Dr. Professor David Black Blackman, Blackman. Um, we just met, so uh, I don't have too many good stories to tell about him. He's going to have to tell them himself. He's Professor of Sustainable Energy and Transportation at California State University in Los Angeles. He holds the uh, held the uh, Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Alternative Energy Technology at Chalmers University. And those of you who know Chalmers, it's in Sweden. And that's where one of our top researchers that used to work here is a professor. So, and uh, our Electric Vehicle Center has lots of connections with them. So that's another good connection. He's a the technical director and the founding member of the Cal, Cal State LA Hydrogen Research and Fueling Facility. They actually have their own hydrogen station. Uh, we used to have one here at UC Davis, and unfortunately, it disappeared. Um, didn't just disappear, but. Uh, so he teaches courses on electric vehicles, on fuel cells, photovoltaics advanced engine designs, a lot of the topics that you know, many of you are working on, and that's a big feature of our program here. He has a bachelor's and master's degree uh, in thermal physics and engineering from St. Petersburg State Technical University in Russia, and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the State University of New York at Buffalo, now called University of Buffalo, I believe. They Both are correct. Right. Yeah, but I think they new branding. So we're going to hear, and the title of the talk, and this was really, I think, to engage us here, is Beyond Three Revolutions, the Hydrogen Economy. So we're going, there's lots happening with hydrogen, and I know a number of you are working on hydrogen, so we're very delighted that you came here and to spend time with us. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's a fantastic opportunity to engage with all of you. Uh, and it's a huge audience, you know. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me again. And uh, I'll let's get started. And I'll give you the mystery of three revolutions right now. So if you look at the top, you can see it's an even bright uh, ticket to a presentation at UCLA by Dr. Sperling <laughs> uh, a few years back. So I, I don't know if you remember giving that talk. You probably gave like a ton of those. But uh, that's the first time we met. Uh, you know, I introduced myself briefly. And uh, I think in addition to this wonderful topics, uh, I would like to say we are going or we are starting our next revolution. Uh, fourth revolution is uh, hydrogen economy. Right. So this slide came about from a meeting with the middle school children visiting our hydrogen station. Uh, and that kind of gave me the title Children of Stars. All right. So but we'll get to that. Now, uh, another reference I would like to make is this picture on the right and uh, coming to show the Big Bang Theory. And uh, do you know where it's situated? The story? Say it out loud. Caltech is correct answer. And uh, thank you, right. So Caltech, and this is a Caltech, so it's a good opportunity for me to tell you where Cal State LA is. Right? So it's Caltech right there. It's a seven to eight miles away from my university, Cal State LA. Then we also have another neighbor, USC. And then we have another neighbor, your sister campus, UCLA. Um, and I tell you, competing in that environment is pretty hard. Just in Los Angeles, it's pretty hard. Now, um, so my second point here is, can you find a mistake on that picture in the context of what we are talking about today? Where is the mistake? in the context of today's topic. I 
have a lot of PhD students here, master's graduate, and you can't see an error. All right. So how many electrons hydrogen has on its outer shell? One, and we have <laughs> at least three, right? <laughs> All right, so you know that error here. Uh, but we are not going to hold it against the, you know. How do we know that's hydrogen? Yeah. You know, it's a big bang theory. Okay, that's true. <laughs> right? And so that brings me to the next point, right? To the next point. So this is a big bang theory. And according to big bang theory, all of the hydrogen in the universe was created during big bang. All right. And, and then what happened to hydrogen after that? In a certain spot, it, spots it condensed, formed stars, small stars, huge stars, bigger stars. And superstars burn through their hydrogen. There was enough time in the universe to burn through this hydrogen, implode, explode, and then stuff was flying around. And our sun caught all of that material, formed Earth, and we are children of stars, all of us. Now, and uh, one more reference. This one is a little bit more tight. I mean, it's hard to know, but let me see. What would be this guy doing versus this guy? Any references? Any ideas? Quantum physics. It's theory. <laughs> Sorry, I watched that show like many, many times. So, hey, it's the theory driven of uh, physics. It's theoretical. Well, no, he got Nobel Prize. And when I was in Sweden, uh, I went to see you know the ceremony. I was invited. Uh, John Goodenough, he's an electrochemist, famous battery developer. Um, he was getting his Nobel Prize, and so I attended the ceremony. Uh, and it, this is like our last row. The whole building, you're like at the very end, against the back wall, and the one of the top. <laughs> Top levels, but still, it was very, very interesting to see and uh, participate in this event. All right, so now let's go back to hydrogen a little bit more. Um, uh, so historically, real applications of fuel cell came came about uh, in um, in space applications. So the the first uh, uh, capsules with the uh, with the uh, people flying there, it had uh, 10 fuel cells. And then for the space shuttles, uh, we transitioned to alkaline fuel cells. Um, and so that makes them mobile fuel cells. Typically, we have uh, PEM fuel cells, proton exchange membrane fuel cells for cars, and we call them mobile. And uh, for, uh, for space exploration, alkaline is very good. Uh, it was producing. Um, up to 12 kilowatt peak, seven kilowatt is continuous. It might be related to cooling issues usually in fuel cells. Uh, and so what is interesting, I talked to GPL staff and they told me that after 2000 hours, when you do overhaul of those fuel cells, you know, back then they didn't build them to last. Uh, although 2000 hours is pretty good on a space shuttle. Uh, Overhaul of a single fuel cell that produced 12 kilowatt peak was $2 million. Now, so this one normally, and you will see as we go, I'm not a big proponent of text on PowerPoint. I think it's a bad style overall, but uh, I should be telling the story and a little bit of feedback. So I should be telling the story and the pictures come, right? But this is a, one of those rare slides where I have a lot of text. Where that text came and how old this text? So I created that slide or the text for this slide was extracted in, I don't remember exactly, 2004, 2005. And this text was extracted from a microfiche in the library where I studied uh, why politicians were saying kind of wrong things about hydrogen. I mean, 
they tried to be positive in 2004, 2005, but they were not clearly expressing themselves. So I looked at this historical notes. It's a subcommittee uh, meetings uh, for the House of Representatives, right, and the and the Congress. Um, so this is a top-notch researchers. And it's a, a dedicated committees where they were learning about hydrogen technology. And the years are 1980 and 1986. So these remarks were made in 1980, 1986, and I extracted them 20, almost 20 years ago. All right. And they're still as valid as they were valid 40, 50 years ago. All right. So we have always been enthralled with the fact that hydrogen is an abundant element of this particular planet. And a lot of politicians were saying that. That's why I kind of come. But <laughs> you need to read the second one. And those politicians would never say that because you know that we just operated on one. Very quickly, you know that hydrogen never found free in nature to any extent. Well, it's not exactly on Earth, right? It's stars. It, 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 it. All right. The widespread of hydrogen clearly implies massive energy sources other than oil and gas, and we, that's where we've discussed that. But it, you know, we need to create a whole hydrogen economy. You cannot just say, I want to go hydrogen. We need to create the renewable energy sources. And so abundant that we have leftovers to convert to hydrogen. Uh, there might be disagreement about the size of world's oil reserve. And I tell my students all the time, but surely no one doubts that it's fine. And we're burning through our fossil fuels that were created over millions of years in a matter of a couple of hundred years. So that's kind of a very um, big issue for us and concern. Now, it would take around 50 years to build a new energy system based on renewable resources. And we still haven't started, right? So in 1980, they were saying, we need to get started and it will take 50 years. Uh, we have very adventurous politicians that claim that we can do it in 15 years. Uh, so let's see how it goes. My experience tells me it's very ambitious. Uh, and the next one is very important in light of what is good happening right now. So now, and there are two thoughts right here and we'll kind of dissect those two thoughts. How, I mean, again, it's 50 year old statement. For a gigantic industrial nation such as the US to exist upon a lifetime of tankers traveling 8,000 miles and delivering oil from nations with volatile and stable population subject to subversion by enemy powers is terribly dangerous. Now, can anyone name a recent event that would highlight that statement? Yes. Yes, go ahead, say it. The war. Russia against Ukraine. But, right, but more specifically, what happened? The scarcity of fossil fuels, which provides 80 or 60 percent of oil to Europe. Right, but what happened? What happened? They're claiming territory that's not theirs. No. Okay. I mean, <laughs> different point. <laughs> yes, go ahead. The sanctions on Russia. No. Oh, okay. different point. The scarcity of gas in Europe. It's warmer. Dependence. Economic issues that. No. <laughs> right. didn't, didn't Putin threaten to cut off sales of gas to Germany and the rest of the uh, EU? Oh, it's getting warmer. <laughs> Doing about the pipeline sabotage. The pipeline sabotage, right? So, so yeah, it's not literally a tanker, but. Subliterally, it is a tanker. It's a pipeline that got blown up by whatever subversion of enemy powers, whoever was the enemy of the pipeline. You can interpret differently, but someone didn't like it, right? Or used it in a certain way to, to make us or to make people dependent. So it's very dangerous to be dependent on that. And then uh, there was another issue with the governments when someone in one government asked to have more oil produced and the other government says what? What did the other government say? The other government said, we're actually gonna cut down production of oil, right? 
right? So, so you might not end up with lower prices of oil in the United States, right? So those are after the election. Oops. <laughs> but it's got nothing to do with the election. No, no, no. But that's part of it. It's, 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 it's a current current event. But yep. the whole statement is you are dependent on that, and some powers can exploit yep. whenever they want. Right, we have election now, but it's but you are dependent and you are vulnerable continuously, right? And so, to eliminate US dependent on imported oil, eliminate or reduce deficit, and uh, that's what we sell here at academic institutions provide new jobs for establishing and servicing the new energy system. And you're all gonna have jobs within that energy system, right. So those are interesting historical notes. Usually I present them at the very end, but today I moved them up front because that's what kind of sets up the tone of our discussion. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, or I was in Europe in 2019 and 20, 2020 before COVID. And uh, uh, I was lucky enough to visit uh, uh, a conference uh, fuel cell joint hydrogen fuel cell joint undertaking or CHG. So fuel cell hydrogen joint undertaking. What it means, it's a consortium of all the European countries working on uh, developing hydrogen throughout the European Union. And that was a stark contrast with what we have in the United States is California doing hydrogen. And everyone is just doing whatever they do every day, right? So, uh, and you can see on this map, so later on, uh, they came up with this map of hydrogen valleys, and we'll discuss what hydrogen valleys in the United States hydrogen valleys are called hydrogen hubs, right? Uh, and I just like so <laughs> I went on the stage and had that picture taken just for the memory of that. But, uh, what you quickly learn how far and how in advance Europe was at that time than the United States, because the only thing we had was United States and uh, Germany, Spain, uh, uh, Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Norway was just huge about hydrogen. And so all of those uh, hydrogen valley projects were really a real innovation for me. It's, Really, those guys are already ahead of us. They were so behind and now they're so fast and they're building what? They want to build hydrogen trains in Italy, right? Now, this was also an interesting uh, effort by my students. Um, there was a competition, unfortunately, they don't run it anymore, but it's uh, called Hydrogen Student Design Contest. We participated for many years and the last uh, competition was called Power to Guess. And when we were developing it, uh, inadvertently we ended up with creating a hydrogen valley or hydrogen hub concept. And so, what uh, you find out so you start with renewable energy resources, uh, wind and solar, and then use electrolysis, then there is a storage. And once you have created your hydrogen, which is a universal fuel at the end, why? Because you can uh, run fuel cells inside of the buildings inside of homes. You can use hydrogen in industrial. For example, you can substitute uh, uh, coke in production of steels and uh, do reduction reactions with, oxygen, uh, with hydrogen and remove uh, oxygen from uh, oxides and you have your steels. And then you can use it again in commercial buildings by having fuel cells and there are multiple examples of that already. Uh, and also you can use uh, hydrogen as a, as a fuel for transportation. Uh, at first we started with uh, fuel cell passenger vehicles, just thinking about uh, clean, uh, clean transportation. And then now we are thinking, well, maybe hydrogen vehicles are not as competitive as they used to be against electric vehicles, but there are definitely trucks will be competitive, right? So now there is a transition to heavy duty uh, transportation and uh, with trucks. And after that, uh, I, I talked to my students about the examples of forklifts were already quite a bit prevalent. 
and uh, there was a demonstration shunt, shunting uh, locomotive in uh, Southern California. Uh, and what is good about shunting locomotive with uh, shuffles uh, cars uh, and rearranges the trains. Uh, and one of my students said, well, how about tugboats? And so tugboats are exactly the same concept in the fork. You can have a hydrogen and tugboats can provide uh, clean, uh, it, and you know, ports produce a lot of pollution. So at least if you can substitute. And so again, when I was in Europe, I went to the uh, port of Antwerp uh, and they were already uh, developing a project with uh, hydrogen tugboat, but that was a mixed fuel use, uh, combustion. And again, we have UPS and FedEx and uh, also examples in aviation. So now I'm kind of transitioning into hydrogen hubs section of the, our presentation. Uh, so uh, at first, uh, Biden uh, administration was realizing, finally, they were realizing how behind we were from Europe. And what is, and as I already mentioned, Europe, it was collectively different states trying to work together. And in the United States, we have different states again. And only California was trying, maybe New York was trying, but not really. So, uh, so the, we are now launching. And uh, so the first idea was, was to create an advanced uh, US science and energy, uh, in, you know, in energy topics. So that was uh, the, the theme was called Earth Shots. And the first shot within Earth shots was the hydrogen shot. And the hydrogen shot, and everyone just goes around and says, uh, hydrogen is too expensive. Um, and the uh, idea is to produce hydrogen. And the uh, hydrogen shot is uh, basically one, 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 which is $1 per kilogram per one kilogram of hydrogen, of clean hydrogen in one decade, right? And then, uh, uh, so this is funding a billion and a half dollars of research, uh, especially concentrating on uh, electrolysis, Oops. Okay. on electrolysis, thermal conversion with carbon capture. I don't know how you use carbon capture, but that's part of the research. Uh, advanced pathways of producing hydrogen, deployment and finance. Well, so that's what the hydrogen shot program is funding. And right after that, we found Department of Energy followed up with uh, uh, request for information, but it's kind of like a, sometimes agencies will hint what they want to fund by requesting information. Uh, you give them information and then they will synthesize it in a more specific uh, funding opportunity. Uh, and so this one uh, gives us a very good picture of uh, groups uh, proposing and responding to DOE. And DOE was very specific about disadvantaged communities, job creation, and all of the economic uh, benefits and of clean hydrogen production. And so there was a number of regions that responded. Some responded as multiple states and some responded as a single state. So here, the response was a single state response. Out of all the only ones. one. Yeah, the only one, right. Kind of makes us special. Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. Here. Yeah, uh, let's see what goes, what goes on. All right, so uh, here's a, and you guys are graduate students, right? And mature researchers. And the best thing you can do to your careers, in addition to just being a brilliant researcher, so brilliant minds. Second thing you can do is to learn how to write successful and winning proposals. Because you can be as smart as anything, but if you can't translate your thoughts and you don't have understanding and an experience to apply for grants, that will not get you too far. Right? So one of the things you need to really invest while you're graduate students, write small proposals for your advisors, help them to develop various subsections of proposals, ask for it, and, and also go to various webinars that teach you how to write proposals because it will set you up your careers really good while you're in graduate school 
well, when you're applying for jobs, one of the questions would be, have you done any proposals? And then if you can demonstrate some results, that will really help you in the career, you know, future careers as well. So, so here we are, we are reading this proposal. I mean, it's 150 pages. So we are not reading 150 pages, but the most important things is that table, <laughs> right? The due dates, and you have to meet those. So for the regional clean hydrogen hubs funding opportunity, it finally came out. Uh, it was hinted and hinted and hinted, and then uh, it was you know posted on uh, in September, and then by November they now want us to form some uh, hubs clusters, and then uh, and then twenty page uh, uh, concept paper is due. Then uh, by December, sometime in December we will know what were how good were our proposals or concept papers were. If you are invited, and I don't think it's uh, uh, it precludes you from applying, but it might tell you some or might identify some big issues. Uh, and deadline for full submission. So now between now and this, it's going to be five months. Uh, we are going to do a full proposal, develop a full proposal, which is our outline. So as I said, 150 pages. Um, and then we are going to learn about it on the uh, submission deadline, the review. Comes. I don't know who's going to be reviewing because everyone, every expert is involved. <laughs> All right. So, but we will find the independent reviewers. Uh, that's you know one of the conditions. Uh, I had been invited in my professional life to review in other countries because they couldn't find the experts or there were some issues, right? So I reviewed for Canada and I reviewed it in Sweden as well. So, uh, and uh, pre-selection interviews, summer 23. So we're gonna be negotiating awards in winter 23, 24. So it's uh, years ahead. Uh, and, and with all the grants, you always think about one year before when you're applying and when you actually can start working. That's how you plan ahead all your events. Now, uh, and this is the model that they gave us. It's a little bit hard to read, almost impossible to read, but uh, basically it says, these are resources, fossil fuels, renewables, nuclear power plants. Here's some distribution, carbon sequestration, uh, pipelines, distribution, cars, trains, ships. And here is, uh, you know, industrial power and residential commercial. I want to make a one comment. Uh, I kind of forgot, but on this slide I can do the same. You cannot just make your transportation clean because it's only thirty percent. So the rest of the U.S. energy mix is residential, commercial, and industrial. So it's another 70%. So if you say, oh, I just made my car, all cars clean, doesn't mean that your economy is clean. And as a matter, as a matter of fact, you, you see that it's better to create the whole economy clean because if you're just doing it for transportation, it's just harder. And if you're doing it for everyone, and that's what they were saying for hydrogen hubs or hydrogen valleys in Europe, they wanted to have a whole corridor from Sweden to Italy, interesting reference. But uh, along the way, they want to take have a big offtakers like a steel plants, and then only after you already have big offtakers, you know all that your hydrogen can be used. Then you can start adding transportation. So transportation is not first; is your big offtaker, big producers are first. Your pipeline is first. Your infrastructure. And only after that, you can uh, run the trucks. Now, and uh, so I don't know if you had a moment to read this, uh, but basically, hubs will form, form the foundation for national clean hydrogen network that will contribute to decarbonizing multiple sectors of the economy. And uh, another thing you always read on your grant proposals is how much who gets, right? How you plan your and between 500 to 1 billion per hub. Initially, they were saying it's going to be four hubs, 2 billion. But then 
after RFI, they probably decided to give everyone a geological plan. Right? So you could potentially fund eight to 10 hubs. Um, and the maximum each hub can ask is for 1.25 billion with substantiated you know, uh, statements, substantiated. And then and the next is, is gonna be, uh, we're just gonna, each hub will get 20 million first 18 months. And then the whole thing needs to be expanded in four years. It's not going to happen. If you imagine, I don't know what people think. In my professional opinion, it's not going to happen in four years uh, because it's a lot of money. And if everyone in the country is spending all that lot of money for the same pipes, for the same compressors, for the same uh, electrolyzers, uh, and all other way fittings. The little things will actually slow you down. Um, whether we have the industry to support that within four years, I, 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 I don't think we will be able to spend that much more money if, you know, because it's just everyone will be competing. I think they've, they've extended it, yeah. Now it's out eight to 12 years you can spend it. <laughs> okay. All right. So thank you. Um, and then uh, here's a brief review. We have three more slides on hydrogen hubs. So there is a state of Washington hub, WISH, it's a Western Interstate Hydrogen Hub. Unfortunately, it doesn't have Oregon. And for us, California, we really want to have a really good pipeline from California to Washington uh, through Oregon. Uh, so the trucks and the goods can go from Port of LA, Port of Oakland, Port of Long Beach. All right. Then we have, uh, this one is interesting, and I think this one has a, has teeth to make it because of the industry in the Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, New York, and New York around Nysodra research programs. Uh, those have been green for a while, so I think there is this good chance that this hub will be, uh, and the uh, governor of New York, I believe, uh, made an announcement that we're multi-state. Another multi-state is, Midwestern, and so it includes Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Just because of the sheer number of the states involved, I think this one could make it. This one is interesting. This is Appalachian region of clean hydrogen, but it's only a state of West Virginia. And when we talk about equity and all other issues, um, I'm kind of on thin ice here, but West Virginia, you probably know, is a coal state with the miners and uh, with, the, with the US policies reducing the need for coal, you need to create other industries. With, so it's a toss up for me as far as, you know, I don't know what they're gonna propose, but the workforce and the retraining of the people into the new and providing new opportunities if you're giving up on coal, it is a big issue for West Virginia. All right, and then we have uh, um, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. So we talked about uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico uh, with Louisiana. Louisiana is famous for what? In our context. Excuse me, LNG. For for other opinions, what Louisiana is famous for? Oil process. So there is a lot of oil uh, being processed and uh, uh, refined in Louisiana. And you know that modern uh, processes require hydrogen. So there is a lot of hydrogen production and a lot of pipelines in Louisiana. So they might be sharing their know-how and expertise. So oil industry has a lot of knowledge how to deal with hydrogen, all right? So that one, I don't know, it's a toss up. This one, I'm not sure it says uh, Great Lakes Clean Hydrogen moves forward, but this is one is led by University of Toledo. So I don't know if they can pull it off. I mean, it's, it's a great consortium of various uh, players. And I don't know how like labs can do multiple hubs, but our hub doesn't want <laughs> A split split uh, organizations between different hubs. 
right. And then there is one more that is coming about. This is a uh, this one. Yeah, Washington State Coalition is. So this is another coalition right there. Pacific Northwest Coalition Association. So I don't know if this one will make it in. All right. That was probably underpinned by Washington State University. Oops. Let's go back. Sorry, it's too many buttons on this remote. You never know. Okay, and this is California. Uh, Luke Fulton is representing. Uh, he works every day, right? He, Guys, developing this document. Uh, there is a multiple. How many? Can we say how many partners? I think there was 180, 200 applications that have uh, signed on to an agreement. Yeah. Right. So it's about 200 entities in California. Uh, obviously, we have uh, international companies that do business in California signing up. Uh, but I just want to highlight the, the two entities present in the room. Is uh, University of California? That's the top top layer of the <laughs> of the network, and somewhere in the middle of the top of the network, I did find my logo. That's Cal State LA University with our high vision space. Um, just wanted to highlight, really good company. By the way, Bosch uh, buys uh, fuel cells from Sweden at PowerStar. So Cal State LA high vision fueling facility. That's where I work. Uh, it was uh, funding we received in 2008, 2009. We built the station in 2010, 2011. Then we fixed it, make it work. And it's a beautiful high vision station right on campus. I walk out of my, it doesn't get any better as far as like being a scientist. You walk out of your office, you walk into your lab, right? Uh, you don't need to commute somewhere else. Uh, so we have a lab, living lab, high vision station right on campus. Both myself, technical staff, and our students can come to the station in Egypt. Uh, so this is the funding, and I would like to express my gratitude to California Resources Board that at the time they had funding for high vision infrastructure, and that was awarded to Cal State LA. DOE funding, and QD funding, NSRC, Mobile Source Reduction Committee, Air Quality Management District, they are big supporters. Um, and then there was a private foundation and AAA provided funding. Um, and the station uh, was uh, very important in the network because it was station number six in California when it was built. We were the first station in the world to start selling high region by kilogram because we had a very precise meter. Uh, and so when the state was ready to do that testing, uh, our station was the first, and uh, you will be laughing at it. Uh, Audi and uh, uh, Volkswagen, Passat, there, so uh, Volkswagen had two fuel cell vehicles that were fueling at our station in 2014 during a, a layout of show. And then after that, the diesel gate happened. Right? And they never invested into hydrogen any, you know, into hydrogen technology. They only gave money. All this money was given to electrical uh, vehicle infrastructure. It's, it's, it's a bizarre. It's bizarre. Yeah. But they had it. Uh, just, just interesting fact. Um, okay. So this is how the station looks inside. Uh, we have a storage, 60 kilograms. We have a compressor that uh, takes hydrogen from electrolyzer. It's the next slide. Uh, and we have two boost compressors. They can really quickly fill up a car uh, uh, at a rate of one kilogram per minute, but we slow them down. And we have a chiller. You need to cool hydrogen. Uh, our chiller is minus 20 degrees, but now new stations are minus 40. And the colder your hydrogen is, then the faster you can fuel the cars. Um, then this is our electrolyzer. It came in container by Hydrogenics, and Hydrogenics has been purchased by what company? It's a famous Belgian Canadian company. 
that makes electrolyzers around the world and it was purchased by was purchased by Commons. And Commons is a famous world company that makes what? Diesel engines, right? So, but they wanted to go green, or I, I don't know, you know, but they wanted to have a claim on involvement with hydrogen and being green. Uh, good for them. Uh, and uh, they purchased uh, hydrogenics that already had a few projects in the works, and suddenly Commons were claiming was claiming all of the projects belonging to Commons. That was an interesting, interesting process. Very quickly, Commons says, "Oh, we're doing the hydrogen train. We're going to do." Hydrogen buses, we're doing this and that. It was really quick. Uh, and that's the power of acquisition. So, what the electrolyzer will have? It will have the first section is uh, electrical and water. Water is checked for quality, it needs to be pure uh, distilled water. Uh, then uh, there is uh, um, converters that convert AC to DC. And then DC goes into this uh, two fuel cell stacks. It's an alkaline uh, electrolyzer. Uh, after hydrogen is produced, it has a little bit of moisture. So it goes in bit into the last section, which is dryers. And once it comes out, there is a tiny, tiny pipe and goes into this compressor and then into the storage. So one of the studies, we did several studies. This study was uh, done by a high school student. I just had a, happened to have a talented high school student who came and said, I want to learn about hydrogen, I want to help. And she did two projects for me, a failure map, and then uh, a video. So if you go online on YouTube and type called State LA Hydrogen Station, there is a wonderful three minute uh, video. And even we used, uh, a drone to film it from the top. So it's a beautiful video. Very, very impressed with her work. Uh, and she is a student in Pomona College. What did you do? I keep forgetting which one was called there, but it's very good. Uh, and, uh, and so this slide shows you what fails in the beginning uh, of the life of the station, the teasing problems. And then what starts to fail second year, third year, right? Our children were still started failing third year quite a bit because we needed a good replacement pump. And in the beginning, it was failing because there was a sensor, hydrogen leak sensors were tripping up until we calibrated and we got good sensors there. Um, so then uh, valves were started failing in the dispenser, just a lot of issues in the second year. Electrolyzer had some issues with the water valves and all of the little things. It was working fine, but kind of uh, little things just were taking it out of service. And also the wires were crossed, you know, like when you have a three phase electricity, um, we needed to, to redo, re rewire it and then it worked better. And so multiple things. So it's a state of the art, but it's a research station just by uh, looking at what breaks. And, uh, of course, we learn to make stations better, uh, but that's the reality. When the station starts to operate, it goes down quite a bit until we figure out what, what's failing. We also recently got a full solar installation on campus, one megawatt. Before I had my own 10 kilowatt installation on my engineering building, but now we have, uh, uh, we sell our, our credits, but then we buy our credits back. Same thing, but then we can use low carbon fuel standard. And, uh, and, and you know, solar shines only for five, six hours. So if you have electrolyzer, it can run day and night on solar. So in reality, a good model would be to have some storage with battery, daily storage, and then you have electrolyzer that can run smaller electrolyzer than your. Uh, power one you know the solar power and uh, it just runs all day long 24 hours i don't think it's good to have a big electrolyzer expensive and just run it for a few hours per day we also have a very robust uh, yes um, so uh, did you like solar you like that has a good connection it's uh, our microgrid on campus our microgrid okay yeah 
It's basically we do have a you know campus consumes far more five six times more than this solar uh, during peak hours, but uh, overall it's a microgrid because you have a substation that comes from the grid power and then it's just distributed on campus as a microgrid. So we have also uh, EV charging, and it's uh, one of the largest networks uh, on CSU campuses. Here's my three revolutions. Revolution number one, uh, <laughs> we get shared mobility with uh, 18 vehicles, uh, hydrogen vehicles, very popular among students. The only limitation was you need to be 21 or older. I, we, I was running this program. I could never get a vehicle. It was so popular. <laughs> Um, wow, well, those first dollars free and five dollars out of number three. All right, however, that program did not survive COVID, so we started in 2018 and we had to shut it down in 2020. So now we still have seven vehicles in operation. Then, uh, electric vehicles, it's an eco car project, and congratulations to UC Davis for being back into EcoCar competition. I did it uh, for seven years, EcoCar 2, EcoCar 3, and I was a lead advisor. And I tell you, it's one of the worst jobs. I mean, it's the most rewarding job on one hand, when these students get jobs at General Motors and all other big companies. But as far as how it burns through you as a faculty advisor, and I know Dali, uh, uh, she left, but, um, you guys got to give her as much support as you can. You know, it really, really takes several faculty advisors, a lot of uh, student leadership to run uh, a flagship program like that. So, um, <laughs> never, never <laughs> convert an existing car, build and design cars from the beginning because shoehorning uh, all these new computers, all the batteries, all the electric motors inside of the existing car with so many no-cut zones. They tell you, you can't cut here, here, here. <laughs> anyway, and uh, number three revolution is uh, automated vehicles. So as a part of the EcoCar project, we also were developing some ADAS system. Uh, and then we did some LiDAR work with uh, and that my students from Antwerp. Um, so he talks about Yale University. Yeah. Next door. Yeah, next door. <laughs> All right, and then uh, this one is just a fun. I mean, we've done a ton of projects, but this one I really like because we did it ahead of Department of Energy. This is the condenser of water out of the fuel cell vehicles. It has a, a heat exchanger, which we adopted the in intercooler from supercharged you know, vehicles. So it's an intercooler with a fan. And then we did uh, some uh, cyclonic, you know, like a Dyson uh, vacuum. So same technology with the cyclones and the water gets collected much better. So we, we did some tests. And out of nine kilograms of water, um, on a cold day like this, we can get up to three kilograms of water. Because if you know, out of fuel cell, it comes out not just a vapor, it comes out five, six times more nitrogen. And so when you're trying to extract moisture out of this mixture with nitrogen, it's a lot of cooling uh, that you need to do. So that's why it's not a trivial, trivial test. So what I like about it, this uh, year, uh, there is an annual merit review at the Department of Energy, and they were introducing their emergency truck. So someone's got a big contract on the hydrogen emergency truck, and the first thing they uh, reported was, oh, we did the condenser unit. Uh, oh, any authors here? That was a study done at the uh, Institute of Transportation Studies. Yeah, you see this? Marshall Miller led that one. Right. And I found this uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting slide in particular that talks about what our future uh, between hydrogen and electric and internal combustion engine vehicles. And what you can find here, very, um, uh, I disagree with the, 
I would put just heavy duty, but it's a long haul right here. And so they're just going to have a little bit of combustion left, 20%, and that is hydrogen. And that's the real, you know, why hydrogen for trucks is better. Where you can see in the light duty vehicles, uh, in cars, uh, we have prevalence 70 80% is going to be electric cars, and just a small percentage is going to be uh, hydrogen cars. Uh, and it's certain demise of uh, light duty hydrogen vehicles because batteries are getting better. But in reality, they are going to stay heavy. And for a long haul, when you have to make money on transporting goods, you cannot be transporting batteries with you. Right? And uh, hydrogen is much, much lighter. And also, you can charge hydrogen into those vehicles or fuel those vehicles faster than you can do with electric. So there is certain, you know, if you talk about uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles, electric vehicles also need the infrastructure. You can't charge your Tesla overnight. It's just not going to happen at home. You need fast, fast. Uh, and so I really like that slide. It tells a lot of story. So uh, interesting here is that we lost the edge with light duty vehicles and manufacturers are not really trying to manufacture. So maybe we're going to get some BMWs, but uh, Nexo is here is our hydrogen station and they were filming a commercial. So that is a picture of you here, Jack. Um, we have about 12,000 vehicles in California. And what is interesting, look at that picture. What is interesting, that the Toyota Mirais are now coming back from three year leases. And these cars are sold uh, in disadvantaged communities. They are sold in the communities around Cal State Valley High Station. And right before sale, they come on a truck back to get refueled. Because during the processing and resale, the releasing, um, um, they're empty. So they come and they get fuel. And, I, and they are the most affordable sedan cars. They were sold for $16,000, $18,000 with a $15,000 refueling cost. That means you can refuel hydrogen for $15,000 for several years, actually, might, might last. Uh, this is just a hydrogen network um, in Southern California. Uh, and you can see the status of these uh, hydrogen stations online it's called the uh, station status operational system uh, sauce uh, and uh, and some stations are on some off they, they break I, I showed you the, the picture the diagram stations can break for any reason out there any day any time uh, and uh, and so we are going from 55 right now to 200 in a few years so that's the goal and that's the goal of California Energy Commission Fund. Okay. So now I'm, I'm kind of transitioning into examples of how we can build of transportation applications of hydrogen economy. All right. So Hyundai had a successful demonstration in Switzerland. And when I heard about that, oh my God, they have hydrogen trucks in Switzerland. <laughs> um, uh, and so this is a was very successful deployment. Why hydrogen trucks? And so I was in Sweden when someone told me about that project. Why? Why not electric? Why hydrogen trucks in Switzerland? What do we know about Switzerland? What do you like to do? Just say, just say, skiing. Skiing, and what that implies? Yeah, the, 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 the mountains. The mountains, right? right? And the mountains do what? They burn through electricity very quickly. And plus, you, you basically hold in your big heavy battery, right? So there is a clear, clear, clear advantage there. Uh, and then we have 30 more coming to Porto Loco. So that's going to happen real soon. This is my French friends. Uh, uh, so there is a company in, in, in France. Busan, and uh, their main business is manufacturing logistics vehicles for ports, warehouses, and they, for many years, they manufactured them as electric vehicles, 
Then they started manufacturing one of the hydrogen vehicles. And one day they went to the Takar Rally in 2021. And they got a bug that they wanted to build and demonstrate their skills by creating a, a Takar competing truck. And they entered the competition and they completed all of the legs of the competition. They had some exclusions as a sustainable vehicle. Uh, they got refueled uh, several times uh, on each, uh, uh, in each day of the competition, um, but from a trailer. So that was a very interesting and the trailer only had 300 bar. So they would, get, they would be getting in the truck 180 bar, but still they competed and were successful. And it's an amazing achievement for hydrogen vehicles. So, and so now they're trying to build a platform on hydrogen and also got a contract with another French company, Symbio, to continue building uh, Android vehicles. And they even came visit us on campus. So we like this is my hydrogen racer vehicle. This is our previously before me built uh, 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 solar solar eagle vehicle. Um, and so we kind of had a few shots. We also fuel trucks, and you can see a high zone truck came in and asked to be fueled. This is pulled by another truck. We fuel buses. It's not our main business because once we fuel, we are done for the day. <laughs> but uh, we, we like to provide that service. We also do trailers uh, and trailer service uh, uh, so that other projects in Southern California can get hydrogen. Uh, that's the locomotive. Uh, and that was an early effort by uh, vehicle projects. I don't know if you've heard that name. It was in Colorado, I believe, was a company. And they did mining vehicles and they did that switch locomotive for BNSF. Uh, and also, there is a zillion of examples of now light duty trail uh, rail. And what is interesting about hydrogen, it's easier to build a hydrogen station than build what? The electrification, the electrification of the entire railroad. It's easier to build hydrogen station here, hydrogen station there then electrify. And there are many regions that it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, and Italy has small tunnels, so you cannot put tanks on the top. You have to design with the tank somewhere else, for example. I just, but it's possible. And the Ballard also is building a hydrogen train. Forklifts I already mentioned, and we even you know, fueled one for demonstration. I really want to have one for lift on campus. That's a uh, hell of a It's, it's actually cost too much. But if you're running, uh, uh, you, you know, if you ask me, where is the most success of fuel cell vehicles? Warehouses. It's 50,000, if not more, forklifts. Where the benefit is, they are clean, no emissions. And they don't need the extra building to recharge the batteries. They don't need extra time to recharge the batteries. And you can uh, run shifts 24 7. So those are for high sweat shops, warehouses. Uh, this is the best solution. Uh, there is a lot of maritime development, some just a fuel cell, not for propulsion, just for the rest of the ship, you know, some electrical loads. But uh, what is interesting. Uh, you know about Australian projects or Chile thinking about making liquid, excuse me, hydrogen. So Kawasaki is developing a hydrogen, liquid hydrogen carrier. But there are many, many examples. If you start, uh, there is a marine and hybrid magazine, really top notch, so you can read more about hydrogen ships. And another related topic is hydrogen hubs. And I think ports are one of the best examples of creating an economy around uh, a certain type of business, but it has all kinds of uses. We have maritime use, we have uh, logistics vehicles, we have containers taking out, we can uh, uh, even, not even ships going on the uh, hydrogen, but we can even bring ships with liquid hydrogen. Not that our port wants to do it, but conceptually, or you can bring liquid ammonia, right? So, so ports can be really a hub, or in a place where you can get uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, applications of hydrogen and uh, 
use it as a hub, and then other applications of hydrogen will be exposed. Concept. This one is interesting. This is the hydrogen ferry that is going in. Um, um, I'm going to finish quickly. So it's going in. Um, it was built in the state of Washington, but it's going to be used as a ferry in San Francisco. And when it was fueled for the first time, you can see a trailer. Some of the hydrogen is from where? From Cal State LA, right? So it had to go from California all the way to the state of Washington to give it first uh, first part of hydrogen. And this is another French uh, ship. It's a yacht. It's catamaran yacht that uses solar and fuel cells for propulsion. And when they came to Los Angeles, we gave them distilled water because their desalination unit was not working. Oh, okay. Almost done. Yeah. And uh, right there. So two more slides. Okay. So uh, and then the aviation. And so I talked to these people as well. So the company is called Zero Avia. Very interesting uh, developments. Uh, they work both in England and in the United States here in California, Northern California. Company is called Zero Avia. And one of the demonstration projects they're working right now is um, you can see this is a traditional uh, uh, jet prop engine. And this is an electric engine, uh, electric motor driving a prop and they have a fuel cell and hydrogen inside of the plane. Um, and so what they were, uh, have accomplished so far is a high speed taxi. So high speed taxi is actually a lot of load on the plane or on the propulsion. Uh, so they demonstrated and I think in the future it's very soon they're planning to fly. Um, and this is the you know a shameless plug for my own product. But uh, I would recommend you guys go uh, online, like even on YouTube, and watch this 15 minute documentary. Uh, it's called The Hydrogen House, and it's a Swedish house built by Hans Olaf Nilsson. Uh, Is that uh, Hans Olaf right there? What? Is that him? Yes. I know. He's a cool guy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's gotten older. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hans Olaf built this wonderful. A solar house, and you can see it in Sweden the, during winter uh, 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 or fall, the sun doesn't go up too, too high, so it even has a, a solar on the, on the wall. This is his hydrogen storage, this is his batteries, this is the, his uh, fuel cell. But watch the whole uh, uh, documentary, it's 15 minutes. I designed it to be very technical. I designed it to be uh, um, an introduction for a hydrogen house project that I run with my students, right? And so, um, uh, hopefully you like it, but it's a, a hydrogen hub in a bottle, right? Or a hydrogen hub in a hole. And what is interesting about uh, Sweden, it's a seasonal storage of hydrogen, not not like a day or a month. He's making all his hydrogen for all his winter time during summer. So that's an interesting engineering design where we don't have that problem here in California. Might, but we don't need a whole season of hydrogen being stored. Uh, and he found really cool solutions for the compressor, really cool solutions for the electrolyzer. The house was built 2015, 2016. So uh, he's constantly improving it, but you know, really trailblazer. And now his company is contracted throughout Sweden and probably other countries to build various hydrogen systems. So you start as a visionary on one thing, and now you can have a multi-million dollar business. Um, have a few more slides, but considering we are almost at the end. Uh, I'm opening up for questions.
Okay, and of course, conclusion is revolution number four. We got to write the chapter together and I'll be the book. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I was wondering, and thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if there is a different production level with different kinds of water and which kind of water you're using and how can that affect in the future? You know, let's say for California where there's very little water, how can that help? Yes. So the in our particular case with our hydrogen station. Um, we use uh, city water that goes through uh, reverse osmosis with tanks. And uh, depending on the usage, every few weeks, we have to swap the tanks uh, and to keep producing uh, deionized water. And that's the only one electrolyte will take. Basically, it has a special sensor. And whenever that sensor kicks in and says, oh yeah, I don't like the water, we do the swap. And then it will run that water with a delay and then test it. So it will bypass the water, it will delay and then say, okay, I like the water, then I can start running. So uh, in terms of uh, using seawater, uh, it's almost impossible to use with current technologies to use seawater due to the mineral content and electrochemical reactions that take place in electrolysis. So it requires desalination, at least to a certain degree. So people are working on, but I, I, there is no solution for direct electrolysis. You just go, I mean, everything works for a few hours, maybe you can make it hundred hours, but eventually it will go down. Uh, I, we have uh, probably a few civil engineers here. They can tell us more about fresh water availability in California. Yes. It seems like there's a lot of benefits to hydrogen. How, how come there hasn't been more adoption up to this point? Like, is it is the biggest problem that like it's hard to have the technology without the infrastructure? And it doesn't make much sense to have the infrastructure without the technology. Is that the biggest problem? Or? It's a maturity problem and it's a problem of uh, when you build a Rolls Royce or you buy a Rolls Royce, right? It's a one-off hand-built product. And then we can have, and I don't want to sound negative, we can have Toyota vehicles, right? Mass production and they become very cheap and affordable. So when you start very complicated technology and that's what we started this presentation with, um, fuel cells that were flying on space shuttles, right? Even service on them cost two million dollar, right? So that's your Rolls Royce, and now we have to go through this gradual build up of our economy of scale, and so economy of scale hasn't happened. And that's why everything is so expensive. But as we continue developing, hopefully prices will be more affordable. And besides the hydrogen shop. Uh, there are other grants that the Department of Energy is funding with uh, certain goals in mind uh, for fuel cell costs. Fuel cell costs have come down because we now learn how to apply catalysts to the carbon ink and then to the membrane in a certain way that the platinum content is many, many times more than it used to be you know, 10, 15 years ago. And then um, fuel cells is a very interesting technology, just speaking of fuel cells. So very interesting technology is that each cell produces 0.5 volts. And now you need to create a fuel cell that will be several hundred volts. And that means you need to have hundreds of cells connected to each other. A single cell failure within that stack will render the entire stack unusable because it will perform as bad as the worst fuel cell within the stack. So the manufacturing, we, need, we needed to learn fast manufacturing, reliable manufacturing and high quality manufacturing so that these hundred cells connected and a single failure of the seal, not even the membrane or platinum or anything would, would create a lot of trouble for that stack. 
So, so we need to learn materials. And that is a highly corrosive environment because of the electrochemistry or because of the amount of current that fuel cells. So all of the materials are under extreme stress and it takes time to develop and find a solution for multiple components of the fuel cell. Say that versus batteries. <laughs> Interesting reaction, but versus batteries. Of course, they have to undergo similar issues, uh, but it's different. And uh, uh, with the fuel cells, we don't have so much weight. They're so much lighter. It's a, overall, it's still simple materials than, than, than the batteries will require the mining and the harm to the earth. You know, the, the fuel cell is a simple Teflon polymer that is certainly modified to be a nephion, but it's a simple, uh, simple uh, polymer, very simple. Carbon ink, the only complication is platinum, but overall it's not complicated technology. Seals, bipolar plates, you know, it's, it's a metals. We learn how to work with metals and how to make things more reliable. But, but it's, it's, a, it's almost a question with the vehicle electrification. Early in the business, we had a company called Coda and they developed the electrical vehicle and they failed. Why they failed? Because there was no infrastructure to support it. And, you know, but there were other problems, but, you know, sometimes you you might have a good product, but it's too early to the market. And so the whole market needs to mature to take on your product as good as your product might be. So now we are kind of solving all of those kind of problems little by little. Yes, please. Can you speak up? Sorry. What is the energy input output ratio of the of your hydrogen station, considering like the water technically you need and also the freezer you said? Uh, and uh, is there any change in this ratio for, for example for, for the house you were talking about, like the even both? So the question was about energy consumption, <laughs> right? And the ratios. All right. So as far as our station, we have some empirical data we've collected, and it's under review for a publication. Hopefully, it gets gets in and published, uh, specifically for our hydrogen station. But uh, and it's a, it's an interesting question. I did. Uh, I did a presentation at fuel cell seminar about 10 years ago. Um, and when we have a very low usage on the station, because if you have to, you have to run your cooling system, all the pumps kind of things have to be working and ready. You're con continuously consuming energy, even if you're not doing sales. So your sales and production really depend on how much demand you have. And the more demand you have, that ratio improves. Um, of course, I would like to extend a warm welcome for you to come and do more extended study at our facility. We host students from around the world and from uh, other campuses, if you would like to do a more detailed study. Uh, fuel cells in general could be a 60% efficient, but we have to include balance of plan. So the current claims, uh, like a loop energy claims over 50% whole system. Um, so blowers and pumps and everything, but of course the efficiency of a fuel cell depends where you are on the curve, electrochemical curve of the. Um, so there is no real clear definition uh, of that efficiency, uh, and then the electrolyzers are the same way, but the electrolyzers surprisingly are even more efficient. They are can they are claiming about sixty to seventy percent efficient. Uh, and when we talk about nuclear power plants and utilizing thermal energy to loosen up the bonds in water, then uh, the efficiencies can be 80 to 90%. And that's why solid oxide electrolyzers are now getting a lot of attention as uh, bound together with the nuclear power facilities. 
And you mentioned Idaho Labs was doing some of that work. Interesting that Idaho Labs claims, oh, we are doing that nuclear solid oxide research, but in reality, they don't have a nuclear power plant. They're just innovating with the whatever electricity. You know, so the high temperature nuclear reactor, they're innovating with external electricity. So that's kind of like, but we are doing it for nuclear research. <laughs> Um, instead of just calling high temperature electrolyte research, they're calling it nuclear research. Absolutely. So, we'll see one more question. Go ahead. Um, what I was wondering is, you know, one of the biggest issues, as you mentioned, was that hydrogen cars have, have really reached that point where you have economies of mass scale, or yeah, economy of scale. Is there something that the state of California can specifically for hydrogen cars to help it help that technology mature. Yeah, so the question was how to get more fuel cell cars on the road, right? And how, so the technology itself is mature. Uh, and as an example, those trucks, most of those trucks, Hyundai trucks, the other trucks have uh, dual fuel cells uh, that are taken from their uh, light passenger vehicles. And that's a very good, I mean, I've known about this, but it's good to bring it up. Light duty vehicles play that important role in fuel cell development and fuel cell adoption. So now these fuel cells can be taken into heavy duty applications. And as a matter of fact, uh, it's actually better to have two or three fuel cells on a truck because you go for different loads. So you can go on one fuel cell or two fuel cells or three fuel cells. Uh, the plant is a little bit more complex, but it's still manageable. Um, and then uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles came as a response to uh, California uh, demanding certain sales of uh, fleet, fleet emissions. And so in order for you to, to sell uh, trucks to the public, you need to sell a certain number of clean vehicles to make the whole fleet to look relative to a certain level of emissions. Um, and so uh, this is already happening in California, Governor Newsom, and with support with uh, CAR, Mary Nichols, and now we have a new chair. Uh, they're all supporting transition of California, uh, the 2035 mandate that all of the sales of new vehicles should be zero emission. So, and it's open market, uh, whether it's electric or fuel cell vehicles. But as I said, there is a significant developments in batteries. So they've gotten better. Market might be improving. It's really what will be available as far as batteries and what will be available needed to be compensated for fuel cell vehicles. So we'll see how it will play around. Yes. Are, are we recording? We're recording, right? Yeah. So this is available. I just wanted to say, I also gave a talk today to the egg students uh, on this topic. And I think this is beautifully complimentary. And we Actually, coordinated. Yeah, we, we, we really coordinated for like 10 minutes <laughs> after I gave my talk but, uh, at lunch. But uh, anyone who wants to spend even more time on this topic, Look at my video and I'll tell the egg students to watch this because I think together they're very, it, it covers like that question and many, many questions and you covered them very well. Yeah, and, and also I have a special vision between batteries and hydrogen. Batteries uh, are produced from certain materials and that certain materials are available only in certain countries. And these materials are processed only by certain companies. And uh, so only certain companies and countries benefit from that economy of so where hydrogen, every country can be producing something and contributing to overall wealth on Earth. <laughs> and on that note, thank you. <laughs>